From the classroom to the emergency room, OR and beyond, you're joining Trauma ICU Rounds with your host, Dr. Dennis Kim. When Osler talks about equanimitas and equanimity and, and distancing ourselves so that we don't get hurt, I have found that there's a healthy balance between working through a practice of equ- equanimitas versus holding hands, making eye contact, diving in deep with my patients. And I call that a burnout prevention program because I can't get burned out if I immerse myself into the lives of these people and they also likewise bring me into their inner circle. That to me is the most robust payback that I could ever ask for in medicine to be considered in somebody's front row. And you know, we did away with it in COVID, but it's time to re-up that, realize this is why we're here. These are the people we're here to serve. And that essentially is the entire message in every deep drawn breath is these are real people. I'm a real person. We're there to serve one another. That's Dr. Wes Ely. Dr. Ely is a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine with subspecialty training in pulmonary and critical care medicine. He's also the co-director of the Center for Critical Illness, Brain Dysfunction, and Survivorship. And Dr. Ely's research over the years has focused on improving the care and outcomes of critically ill patients with ICU-acquired brain disease. For those of you familiar with the CAM ICU tool for assessing for the presence of ICU delirium, yes, Dr. Ely and his team developed this tool, and it's been translated into over 30 languages and is used to measure delirium in ICU-based clinical trials, as well as clinically at the bedside in ICUs worldwide. Dr. Ely has been continuously federally funded for over 15 years. He has over 450 peer-reviewed publications, many of which are considered landmark studies in critical care. In addition, he's published 50 book chapters as well as editorials. We are super excited to have Dr. Ely join us on Rounds. This past week, his book, Every Deep Drawn Breath, was released, and it currently sits as the number one bestseller in critical care. Trust me. You'll want to listen to this one from beginning to end. Dr. Ely, it is fantastic to have you on the show. I have been a big fan of yours, uh, particularly in the area of clinical research as it relates to the ICU. And now you have uh, an actual book that was launched today. Absolutely, Dr. Kim. It's my privilege to be here. And every deep drawn breath was launched today, September 7th. And I know this will come out a few days later for your listeners, but it's a it's a really a neat thing to see my patient's stories and other patients' stories amplified in this form so that we can all try and do a better job in lifting them up and magnifying their dignity and helping them get their life back after critical care. And so what was the major motivation or inspiration for you to write this type of a book? After doing clinical research in large clinical trials with 15 countries, 200 sites, et cetera. And no matter, you know, publishing the New England Journal, Lancet, JAMA, I realized that no manner of these publications, it didn't matter the impact factor, it was not going to be enough. We had to have a, a message out there for the lay public to speak to patients and their families, to empower them, to help them be advocates for one another, and also to help us as healthcare professionals I'm speaking for you, you and me and our healthcare colleagues to realize that we have an obligation to beneficence, not just benevolence. You know, benevolence is is wishing good, but beneficence is actually doing good. And I'm guilty. There's a lot of times when I have I've wanted to do good, but did harm instead. And so I hope that the 20 years of research and the development of all these newer ways of caring for critically ill patients come through these patients' lives and stories that are in this book. Yeah, I had an opportunity to to read your book. Congratulations. It was an amazing read. And some of the stories that you tell and the way that the message comes through 
is just very different than what I'm used to reading. Like you mentioned, those big journals were constantly looking at numbers and looking at the power and the stats. And like you said, trying to convey that to patients and their families, especially in the period of recovery, it's just a completely different language. So thank you for that contribution. It is, you know, I mean, like th th another thing happening in my life right now is that we just published a paper that is now reestablishing usual care for COVID patients, you know, but, but I'm going to contrast that with this book. You know, this paper that we published was the Cove Barrier Study out in Lancet Respiratory this week, where we found, and I helped design this trial myself with Vince Marconi, who's the first author, and I'm the senior author. We found the largest death reduction in all of COVID, and that's on top of dexamethasone. So on top of steroids in our double-blind placebo-controlled trial, varicitinib, which we just call Barry, which is a JAK inhibitor, you know, gives us the largest uh, mortality reduction, 5% absolute risk reduction. And I think that's great. And I, I love the fact that now, you know, usual care is going to be maybe dexamethasone and baricitinib or dexamethasone and TOSI, whichever somebody chooses. But that paper will not do the same thing that this book will do. This book will speak to the every person. It will speak to the grandmother, the, the son, the daughter, the spouse to try and make people realize, oh my gosh, this is a real person. This is a whole person in this bed that needs, that needs the best care that we can give. And the family can make a difference. When they advocate and they say to me, Dr. Ely, you've still got her on sedation. She's still out of it. Why aren't you waking her up today? I'm like, oh God, you're right. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yes, okay. Let's get her out of bed. Let's start mobilizing her. And I mean, we all need this help. Why do you think it's taken so long from the standpoint of healthcare professionals, those of us working in the ICUs? I mean, you've been writing and publishing about sedation practices in the ICU since early 2000s, but it still seems that we tend to over sedate our patients. And it seems that every patient who's on a breathing machine has to be on some form of a narcotic as well as some sort of a sedative. Why hasn't the word gotten out or why do we still continue to practice this way? I love this question and it's worth just pausing for a second. Last week, I was in Belgium, Brussels, at the first in-person critical care meeting yet since COVID. It's the ISICEM. It's Jean-Louis Vincent's meeting in Belgium, which many of your listeners will be aware of. And I showed a picture of a woman who is a COVID patient who was on 100% of how 2 with a PEEP of 18, and she was wide awake on the ventilator, intubated with an ET tube down, and writing on a pad of paper and saying, take the damn shot. She was trying to send the message to other people, get this vaccine. I didn't. You should. And everybody in the meeting was like, oh my gosh, so this can actually happen. Like you can actually have 100% FO2, peep of nearly 20 and be awake. I'm like, yes, this is what I'm saying. And this is what I've been saying for 20 years. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I sedate patients too at the very beginning of intubation, but every day we have to stop these drugs let the patient wake up, try and get them out of the bed. And if it doesn't work, fine. Put them back on some drugs, half the dose, but at least try. Because if you don't try, then you are destined to over sedate, give people dangerous drugs and develop way worse picks post-intensive care syndrome than the patients ever, ever would have. Yeah. So why is it taking so long? I mean, what, what are some thoughts of yours? Like, I wonder why you think it's being on the receiving end of all this research. What, what stops people from doing this? You know, I think it's probably a combination of factors. I can tell you that certainly in our units, nurses will always have two, maybe even three patients to take care of. And when you've got one patient who's agitated and flailing and at risk for maybe self-extubating, maybe the other patient you need to have kind of calm so you can pay more attention to that other patient. But I think a lot of it also has to do with the just education and training and getting out of bad habits because I've been fighting this battle with sedation and analgesia for what feels like years. And, um, you know, a patient might grimace and that gets interpreted as pain. Or sometimes, you know, when patients get rolled, their blood pressure might go up. And so again, they're in pain or anxious. And I do like that approach. I think we want to take a PAD approach to, to sedation and analgesia. And we also got to pay attention to the presence of delirium, which again, I think is something that gets under-recognized, especially if you're not screening for it on a regular basis. So we've really made an effort. When we talk about vital signs and we get a report on rounds, I'd like to hear what the CPOT score is. So are they actually in pain and is there an objective measure of it? What is their RAS? So 
are we actually asking for patients to be completely sedated and not participatory in their care together with a CAM ICU? And I think when you put all those together into like a neuro bundle assessment, it really gives you some more objective evidence in terms of which way you should be going. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, that's great, Dennis. That's a, that's a, that's a little uh, trip down evidence-based lane right there because we have evidence to support all of what you just said. You know, I just am reminded that if you have a patient in the ICU and you're not routinely monitoring for delirium, you're going to miss the delirium 75% of the time. You know, not 10%, not 20%. Three-fourths of the time, you'll miss the delirium. And for the listeners, that number has been incredibly reproducible over the past 15 years of research. We have 15, 20 studies that document this. So you have to measure for delirium. And the reason is because it's mostly hypoactive delirium or quiet delirium. So would it be okay if 75% of the time you missed a pulse ox in the low 80s? Would it be okay if 75% of the time you missed a mean arterial pressure in the low 50s? No. You never would allow that. You would think that was complete malpractice. And yet we think it's okay just because their pulse ox and blood pressure are okay, but they're delirious. I think one of the things that we have to realize is that we are at fault here. You know, we have to point the finger at us to say, yeah, I get it that my one patient might extubate, like you said. And so I need the other patient calm so I can pay attention to the self extubation patient. But why not have you know, family present, if possible, for each of those circumstances, calm the patient down. That's the F in the A to F bundle is family. And that we know the family will be much better than we are at keeping the patient calm. Usually, I mean, there are outliers that we can all think of, but most of the time, that's the voice they want to hear. And during COVID, I call it anti-medicine. I mean, we undid 15 years of progress in about three months of COVID by locking out visitation. And there are lots of hospitals that still have not reopened the doors to regular visitation. And we know that PPE works. And plus we don't have the privilege to harm these people in the way that we have in this circumstance. I I mean, I hope nobody gets really mad at me for saying this, but I think that I am guilty of creating excess harm, both mentally, uh, physically during COVID, and I think that people lose the lose the will to live. People could be dead because I kept their family away from them. I, I don't know how to measure that, but I think that's true. Yeah, I have to agree with you 100%. I think anytime we get a patient coming into our ICU or hospitalized, you know, when they're sort of a, a John Doe or we don't have an identity, I think those patients, especially early in their care, are harmed by the fact that there's no one who loves them to be there at their bedside, to speak with them, to hold their hand and tell them that everything's going to get better and that they're loved. And I think that is huge. And during COVID, the number of patients that were dropping dead or dying uh, with not a, a loved one in sight, you know, and eventually we got the iPads, but that's not the same. Yeah. You know, there's a story in every deep drawn breath that somebody tweeted out this week. Uh, Shari Brosnahan from NYU tweeted this out and I, she said she ugly cried when she read this story. And it's kind of short. Do you mind if I just tell it? Oh, I, I would love that, please. This was really interesting. And I, I'm not going to read it, but it, it's it's only one paragraph in the book. And it's um, I had this patient and she came in. She had widely metastatic malignancy. She was taken out of the OR for an exploratory lap to see if anything could be done. She, it was, you know, totally diffuse. And so they closed her back up, brought her back up to the unit. And there in the unit, as we prepared for her to dive in, in critical care, in, crit- in the ICU, which we knew that was happening. She was septic and, and it, you know, it was just going to happen. She brought the family to the bedside and began hugging them and telling them how much they love them. And she said, you know, do you love me? And then they would say, you know, I love you. And then she'd ask the second person, you know, do you love me? And then we went through this ritual. It was a, her own dying ritual. And she was she was a self-proclaimed atheist. And this was her dying ritual that she went through. And then she said, Dr. Ely, you're part of my inner circle. You know, do you love me? And I had already told her that day how moved I was by her story, by who she was as a person. And she brought me into her inner circle. And the reason I'm telling the story is that 
what I think made Dr. Brosnahan cry so hard was that she said she had never realized that she could be part of her patient's inner circle. And I think it's important for all of us to realize that, you know, when Osler talks about equanimitas and equanimity and, and distancing ourselves so that we don't get hurt, I have found that there's a healthy balance between working through a practice of equ- equanimitas versus holding hands, making eye contact, diving in deep with my patients. And I call that a burnout prevention program because I can't get burned out if I immerse myself into the lives of these people and they also likewise bring me into their inner circle. That to me is the most robust payback that I could ever ask for in medicine to be considered in somebody's front row. And, you know, we did away with it in COVID, but it's time to re up that, realize this is why we're here. These are the people we're here to serve. And that essentially is the entire message in every deep drawn breath is these are real people. I'm a real person. We're there to serve one another. So in the book, you talk quite a bit about PICS and there might be folks uh, out there listening who don't know what that is, but that's the post intensive care syndrome. And it's also deeply or closely related to delirium, which we just talked about. How are the two related and what can we be doing to prevent the development of PICS in our ICU patients? Sure. Delirium is the strongest predictor of the acquisition of acquired dementia. We published this in the New England Journal in 2013 in our brain ICU study. And now we're doing brain ICU two, by the way, Dennis, which is where we're collecting the actual brains of these patients after they end up dying. And we're gonna determine exactly what kind of dementia they do develop. But delir- every additional day of delirium increases the risk of dementia by about a 30% and increases the risk of death by 10%. So delirium is this very profound problem for ICU patients. And what they get on the back end is indeed an acquired dementia where they can't remember things like they did before. They can't do their job. They can't work the computer. They can't remember names. So they basically many times become either mildly or moderately disabled. And this is discussed very, very concretely and uh, data driven wise in every deep drawn breath which I just call EDDB, the book I just abbreviated EDDB, so you'll hear me say that. The other aspects, though, of PICS, the post-intensive care syndrome, include post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and then the muscle and nerve, the myoneuropathy that patients develop. So that's essentially it. It's dementia, PTSD, depression, and then myoneuropathy, which we call ICU-acquired weakness. And we don't want to forget about PICS-F, which is that the family develops PICS. A a large number of patients, families develop aspects of these same problems. And so what we, what we are emboldened to do, what we're challenged to do, I think as healthcare professionals is on the front end during the ICU to employ newer technology, newer techniques to reduce this problem of PICS acquisition. And on the back end of the ICU, we have to realize that post ICU clinics, support groups, cognitive rehab, physical rehab, these have to be the things that are still our job when somebody leaves critical care. I think that's so important. And for those listening, again, when your patient's on a ventilator or critically ill every day, or even better yet, twice a day, you want to be assessing, do they need to be on this particular medication or sedative or analgesic? Um, You want to make sure that they're doing spontaneous breathing trials along with their SATs or spontaneous awakening trials, and then start to really think, is my patient at risk for delirium? Screen them. And then you mentioned family presence. And the other thing is early mobilization, which it is sometimes tough to convince people to try to get patients outside of just keeping the head of the bed up 30 degrees to, to start that process in the ICU. It's almost like there's an invisible barrier where PT, OT, and they can't get into the ICUs. I'm not sure how you've dealt with that at your institute and maybe some tips or tricks for those of us who are having difficulty getting our ICU patients mobilized. Okay, great. Dennis, first, that was a great walk through the A2F bundle that you just did for the reader, so for the listener. So I won't repeat it. But go back, rewind your iPad or your your iPhone and listen to what he just said. But let's make sure they know why. So the evidence is very strong here. 
We've got data from 6,000 patients in the California Sutter Health System and from another 15,000 patients across the United States, including Puerto Rico. That's the 21,000 total patients. And then another 4,000 patients from Montefiore. And then, so these studies just keep growing. So we're over 25,000 people large here in terms of data which say the following. If you comply more readily with this A2F bundle, which with Dr. Kim just went over with you, then patients will have a higher likelihood of living. They'll have, and it's a dose response. So the higher you go in compliance, the higher the survival rate goes, the shorter the ICU and hospital length of stay go, the reductions in delirium, coma, restraint use all get better and better with more compliance with the A2F bundle. And in addition, I love this outcome. We have less people going to nursing homes and less ICU bounce backs. So the data are very strong, and those are 25,000 patients worth of data on top of the individual RCTs, which we did and published in the New England Journal Lancet and JAMA, 40 papers, which built that bundle. So this is rock solid data. And um, you asked me, what are the tips? You know, the number one tip here is don't try to climb, climb Mount Everest, meaning that don't say, okay, on April the 1st, we're going to change every bed in our hospital and we're going to do the bundle, the A2F bundle. Much better is the approach that the IHI, Don Berwick and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement take, which is what can I do by Tuesday? In other words, what one patient, one nurse this Tuesday can I organize to do the bundle on? And then let's review that one patient, one nurse, one interaction, see what went right what went wrong, and then on Wednesday, go back to the same patient, same nurse, try it again, do it better, learn. So we're climbing little hills instead of Mount Everest. And then what happens is the other nurses start saying, wait a minute, that patient's walking. Why, why can't my patient walk in? I saw that good thing happen. I want that good thing to happen over here. And it starts to catch on. So instead of them feeling like you're shoving it down their throat, they're asking for it. And that changes everything. That's a real game changer. And I like the idea of small baby steps. And that's what we've been doing here. And it's been a slow rollout, but it takes time. Culture change takes time. And so patience is a friend. And I think ultimately in the end, we all want to do right by our patients. And I think it's so important, like you just mentioned, to bear in mind the things that we aren't doing for them or the times that we're causing harm and to really... Put a mirror on yourself and figure out what you can be doing differently. Right. When it comes to delirium then, so we screen our patients. We've got the CAM ICU. There have been uh, several studies out there written by folks like yourself on the use of dexmedetomidine or Presidex or alternatives to standard sedation and analgesia, for example, propofol and fentanyl. Does it really make that much of a difference or are we starting to realize now that maybe whether it's propofol versus dex? versus some other sedative, the key point is to try to minimize the dose and then do what we've been talking about, make sure that you shut it off and assess patients' neurologic status frequently. Yeah. The, so listen, let me give you the, the history on this. So when, you know, when most of your listeners were either still in diapers or not in medicine yet, I know you got a lot of young listeners, we were giving everybody fentanyl and Bursad. You know, everybody got that. We started doing randomized control trials in the 2007 to 2008 range proved that avoiding benzodiazepines was the way to go, lighter sedation, better outcomes, shorter time on the ventilator, shorter time in the ICU, less delirium and coma. This is the MEN study, the PRODEX study, the MIDEX study, SEDCOM. These are the names of all these RCTs. All those that I just mentioned were published in JAMA. So not slipshod journals, very high impact randomized controlled trials. Um, then Yahya Shahabi starts publishing the data on light sedation, does a great job with these SPICE trials, and brings us to current day where we were thinking, you know, um, I wonder if DEX would be better than propofol, or is it just better than benzos? Because propofol is shorter acting, et cetera. And so if you take SPICE 3, which was in the New England Journal, and then you take... Um, our MENDS2, M-E-N-D-S-2 study, which was also in the New England Journal. These are both of the last uh, 18 months or so. That's a very interesting story. Do you want me to take you through what, I, what my take-homes are from FICE3 and MENDS2? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, here's what, I, here's, what I, here's what you get. 
Spice 3 was a lesser sit group. Apache score is 22, 23, and yet deeply, deeply sedated. Um, the goal was light sedation, but they still got gobs. For example, 64% of the DEX group got propofol too. So there was a, a, the clinicians felt a large need to give, they would not let it just be DEX metatomony. They, they wanted also to have propofol on board, even though it was supposed to be DEX versus usual care, which the propofol was supposed to be the, the usual care arm. So the DEX group got all this crossover. Why? The clinicians had a deep sedation culture. Okay. Now, if you contrast that with our MENS2, M-E-N-D-S2 study, this is the New England Journal, you've got sicker people with Apache scores of 27 median. That is, that is super sick people. And yet we had a lighter sedation approach where we did not get that crossover. We had DEX versus propofol. And how could it be that we were able to achieve lighter sedation with Apache scores of 27 than they were with Apache scores of 22? It's culture. It's the enrolling sites and one study versus the other. Now, in neither study was there a difference between the two groups. So at the end of the day, my answer to you is kind of what you said. Culture and a, and a light sedation approach is the way to go. And if you do that, then you can use DEX or propofol. I still don't think you should use benzos because benzos are so long lasting. They, they're, they're, they build up so much. So I think the prop and the DEX are the two ways to go here. But if you have a light sedation strategy, our MENS2 study in the New England showed neutral outcomes between the two groups. Now, let's just switch over our mindset, though, to COVID and say deep sedation, five to eight days, maybe longer. Unnecessary, I don't think in, in most patients that is not necessary, but I know it's happening. There, I do think that propofol is going to build up. You're going to get a lot. It's very lip, lipophilic. So you get lipo, lipophilicity. And it's going to be a lot building up in the brain. And I do think that probably in men's two, this is now conjecture. I don't have data to say this. Probably if we had long-term COVID sedation, DEX versus probe, I bet you we'd see a difference there. But if it's a light sedation approach like we took in men's two, no delta. I would love to hear your thoughts on a no sedation approach. There's been uh, several papers that have been written, RCTs, uh, The Lancet, New England Journal, looking at a no sedation approach, which certainly seems to be a little bit more resource intensive. You know, having someone at the bedside, like we talked about, having a family member or a loved one would be ideal. Uh, but sometimes they'll just have NAs or nurses or physicians like literally sitting at the bedside, keeping them calm. Uh, have you tried that approach or do you think that's sure. feasible? And this is covered very well in every deep drawn breath. There's a great chapter in there where I'm standing outside of um, of, a, of, a, of a Hans Christian Andersen's house. He's it's in, I'm in Denmark. He's got this daffodil yellow house in Denmark. And I, I remember standing outside the house and thinking, what am I going to see today? Because I was about to go into the hospital there in Adunza. O D E N S E is the name of the town where Thomas Strom and Polly Toft live. And Thomas Strom was the original first author, Polly Toft, the senior author of the No Sedation Study in the Lancet. And when I walked in the units that day, everybody was awake. Patients were all awake. I did not think I was going to see that. I was stunned. They were sick. They were in ARDS and they were awake. Um, I call it analgo sedation because they were using some analgesia, a little morphine, but the patients were definitely RAS zero to minus one at the deepest on the vent. And uh, he made a believer out of me on that trip. I mean, I, I was really like, wow, this is doable. Uh, I need to go back home and, and uh, have an examination of conscience, if you will, and figure out how to do this better for my patients. Right. Um, now, what happened in the subsequent years, because the reader, some of the, your savvy readers are no doubt saying, wait a minute. They redid that study and it was negative the second go round. And that's true. What happened though was in any clinical trial, and the reader won't be able to say this, but you're looking at me on the camera here. In any clinical trial, the, gar the, the goal is the separation of groups. We want these two groups to come in even, randomize them to a different group and separate them greatly. Like for example, in six versus 12, that's a large tidal volume difference, six versus 12. If they'd randomized to six versus eight, we wouldn't have seen a difference, right? So what happened was that the control arm in, in Denmark, by the time that they redid the study, everybody had kind of adjusted what they were doing. 
And so there wasn't enough separation of groups. So there was a neutral outcome. That's that's my read. I've talked to Thomas about this quite a bit. Um, I think that light sedation, no sedation, whether it, it whether the data are from MINS2, whether they're from SPICE, well, SPICE3 had some deeper sedation, whether they're from the uh, the original Yahya Shahabi data where he actually knew that some groups were lightly sedated, or whether it's Thomas Strom, I think we do better for our patients. Let me say it clearly. We serve the human being better if we initiate sedation at the beginning of the ventilator and then every single day stop it, turn it off, remove it, and practice the A2F bundle. And all those data from the SCCM and from Sutter Health and Montefiore support that people will live more often and have a better recovery if we take that approach. Very well summarized. Let's say we screen our patient, they're positive, CAM ICU, they've got delirium. What should the approach be to maybe reversing that, slowing it down, or preventing it altogether? The approach that I like to teach, and it's a great story, a nurse asked me this question and said, what do you do, Dr. West, Dr. Ely, when, when the patient's delirious? And I said, well, we have this mnemonic on, the, on, the, on our icudelirium.org website. That's our website, icudelirium.org. And it's called the Think Mnemonic. And I went through it with her and she goes, no, 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 that's too complicated. Just tell me when they're delirious, what do you do? And I said, well, I look at at diseases, drug removal and environment. And she, without batting an eye, said, oh, the Dr. Dre. (laughs) And I thought, wow, that is so genius. The Dr. Dre. Okay, diseases, drug removal, environment. So that has become my mantra of how I go about dealing with delirium in the ICU. I think what diseases could be leading to this problem? Is it sepsis, COPD, hypoxemia, CHF, um, a bad, you know, whatever. And then I think about drugs to remove. Instead of adding a drug, we remove a drug. Uh, Benzos, sedatives, Benadryl, any anticholinergic drugs, go down the list. Even cefepime, although I think that's overblown. But uh, and then environment is um, is the E of Dr. Dre. And that's your eyeglasses, your hearing aids, sleep-wake cycles, night versus day, ambulation, getting them out of the bed and, and walking them. And I think that Dr. Dre is, is it's just too easy and too good not to run through it on every patient every day. Now, when it comes to, to family, do you at your center allow them to join you on rounds or is it more of a, we'll catch up with you after or are they just kind of parked there? Is there a bed available for them to be? Sure. I, I, my old way was I'll catch up with you later. And I was really committed to this. And I spent so much time in these family conferences and not just to get rid of that, that, that time, but rather to say, you know what, they're missing a lot of great information on rounds. Why not bring them in? And so we actually had a medical student here at Vanderbilt University where I'm a professor and at the VA who said, why don't we have family on rounds? So years ago, this is 15 years ago, We started doing family rounds and we brought one to two people on rounds with us. We can't have 15 people, but one to two people on rounds. And the way the F works, the A2F bundle is that we have those one to two people. They listen. We go through medical language. Do not water down your message. You've got to be talking medical lingo or it gets to be too difficult for us in medicine. We We have language for a reason. So we still talk our medical lingo, but at the end of it, we look at the person and say, let me give you a, a summary of this. And, you know, if they're a doctor or a nurse, then I'll talk to them in medical speak, but most of them are not. So I just say, here's what's going on. And I give them a 30 second explanation. I tell you what, Dennis, it is shocking to me how satisfied people are just listening to the rounds, getting this lay summary. Most of the time, there's no family conference needed. It saves me hours every day to do this approach. And the second part of the family bundle, having the family there, is that they get to ask, are they delirious? Have you measured them for delirium? Are they going to ambulate today? And they kind of keep me honest. You know, I mean, if I'm, if I'm not uh, doing everything, I'm a little hurry, getting paged to clinic, whatever it might be, you know, I might take a shortcut. Well, having the family there stops me from doing that which then stops me from hurting my patient. So that's kind of how we approach it. 
I think, a family presence uh, during rounds, after rounds, uh, as much as possible uh, is so important for patients to heal. When we talk about family, you mentioned PIX-F and how the post-intensive care syndrome can affect family members. And you tell a couple of, of really heart-moving stories uh, in the book about this. What can we do? I mean, outside of all these things to try to identify delirium, get our patients out of bed, once they're discharged, if they are one of the fortunate few who end up going home uh, versus a nursing home, what can we be doing for them in that particular setting? Because in the past, they've had things like outpatient ICU clinics, but that didn't really ever seem to gain a lot of traction. So in terms of uh, services that we can be rendering or providing, any thoughts or suggestions? I believe I believe in the ICU clinic and Carla Steven and Jim Jackson run a beautiful ICU recovery center here at Vanderbilt. There are lots of other places that have them, but I do agree with you that people have tried and had trouble at some institutions as well. So one of the things I think should be the least common denominator of what we should all be doing is allowing patients to meet, especially now that COVID has happened and Zoom calls have been so frequent, is we have these post ICU support groups, <clears throat> excuse me, for our families and for our patients. We have spouse support groups, we have family support groups, and they get on these things and they share with one another and they they have a, a sensitive ear for each other's plight and story and recovery. And they give each other tips about, well, we tried this, how about that? And and they you know they feel like part of a community and less isolated because part of this is that they feel so alone like they're the only ones in the world suffering with this. So I do believe in these in in some creating some form of a support group after critical illness. In addition, I also think that we need to make sure people realize that cognitive rehabilitation is real and and they can get their brain back by doing math and science and you know computer exercises. We have there's a group called Achille that has a, a program called Evolution. There's a group called um, uh, Posit Science that has Brain HQ, or people can just do Sudoku and Scrabble, you know, and just come up with other brain games. One of my patients in the book named Carol Billion, she's a, a, an ICU patient from Maryland who got ARDS and sepsis and multi-organ failure. And we were finished with her interview for the book. I recorded all these interviews for every deep drawn breath. And so all the quotes in the book are, are, um, are direct quotes from recorded interviews. And when the whole thing was over, I said, well, is there anything else you want to tell us? And she said, oh, do you want me to tell you about my brain games? And I said, well, what, what are you talking about? And I had no idea she had done this. She said, oh, well, what I did was I realized that I couldn't do my computer. I couldn't think well. I wasn't able to be my, H, you know, my, my homeowners association leader anymore. So I put myself on a regimen of 30 minutes a day of half the time word and half the time number games. And over 12 weeks, I built my brain power back up and I'm now dancing. And this is her words. I'm now dancing a jig because I can use my computer again and my brain work. Now, what happened with her? OK, what happened? So imagine millions of neurons damaged during critical illness, neuronal apoptosis. And her neurons after the ICU, they are, I call it, get backable. We can get these neurons back if we put them through cognitive rehabilitation. And in every deep drawn breath, I go over the data from Ed, Ed Taub and Mike Merzenich and lots of others that our neurons want to rebuild, but you've got to give them the stimulus to do that. And this topic of learned non-use can be avoided. So learned non-use is when you've got like, like some stroke and you learn to not use your left hand. So the brain rewires to make your right hand do all the work. But if you if you don't allow that to happen and that L in you, that learn non-use doesn't occur, the brain can rewire that left hand. Now, it depends on the severity of the stroke, but I'm talking about critical care dementia. We can rewire this stuff and we're now doing randomized controlled trials. Uh, just remember, cognitive rehab is real. And this is one of the things that we need to be offering to our patients. More evidence will come, but people can get started now. In Canada, when I practiced there, every patient that came in with some form of a traumatic brain injury would actually be seen by a formal neurocognitive scientist, and they would run a whole battery of tests 
across every virtual cognitive domain and get an assessment and then be referred for therapy. And I just don't see that happening here. I'm glad you told that story. I think that that's on us. I think we need to do a better job for our patients and families. A woman yelled at me. She put her finger in my face and said, Dr. Ely, you didn't do your job. And I said, why? What happened? She goes, because you got me. I lived, but the rest of my life has been a disaster and I don't want to keep going. And I got a jo- I got an email this morning from a man, a woman, his name, where he's from this morning, accusing the medical system of ruining his life, saying, I don't want to live anymore. My wife wants me to live, but I don't. It's been two years since my critical care experience, and I can't keep living like this. And he was complaining of cognitive impairment, PTSD, depression, physical problems. It's PICS. And, and by the way, PICS is in a COVID patient, they're long COVID. So long COVID is an umbrella term for the suffering that goes on after COVID. If you were an ICU COVID patient, it's PICS on steroids. So don't think that that's different. It's just part and parcel. Fantastic. Anything else that we should be kind of covering for the the audience out there? I think just for all of us to remember that a lot of our patients are going to not make it. They're going to die. And so we want to focus on the ability to help our patients survive. And if they do survive, we want them to survive as, as whole as they can. And that would be beneficence, do, actually doing good. For those who aren't going to live, our job is not over. It's not like in the absence of being able to save their life that our job's over. No, we have a we have an obligation to provide that person with a comfortable dying process and to amplify and lift them up. This is the essence of mercy. Mercy, which I want to be a merciful physician. Hopefully, we all want to be merciful merciful healthcare professionals. Mercy is the willingness to dive into the chaos of another person's life and provide lifting and healing. So for a survivor, lifting and healing is surviving and and getting recovery on the back end when they're, you know, months down the line. But for somebody who's dying, mercy is diving into their chaos, which is their dying experience. And the lifting and the healing is how can I palliate your suffering and allow you the most powerful, meaningful hours and days that you have and think about how that would be taken away from them if they were delirious. They can't interact with somebody if they're delirious. They can't have a meaningful closure of a relationship with a daughter that they haven't spoken to in three years. They need consciousness and awareness. And this is what the ADF bundle brings, whether you're surviving or dying. Please check out the book, Every Deep Drawn Breath. It is out and available. Like I said at the beginning of the interview, I read it about a month ago. The stories in there are heartfelt, they're emotional, and at the same time, you learn something about ICU that might potentially affect your care or the care you're providing to your patients. So, Dr. Ely, thank you so much for joining. Uh, This has been an honor. Uh, I've loved your research over the years. I quote it all the time. And so to be able to actually uh, have an opportunity to read your book early and then have this uh, podcast recording with you. It's a real privilege. Dr. Kim, I can't thank you enough. You're doing some great work here. I love Harbor, UCLA. Tell my friends there hello. And thank you for all that you're doing to lift everybody up. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, Dr. Ely. Okay, bye-bye.